Welcome to Yachting International Radio, the well-being project, and you're with Green Racing from the Crew Coach. Now, I have two wonderful guests with me today, and they are also part of my membership TC tribe. And I think that Ari and Sally actually connected in the membership. And this is a very rare interview. I think it's the only interview that I've done with two other participants. So thank you both so much for showing up today. Thanks for having me, Corinne. So let's get started. The reason why we are showing up today is because we're talking about quite a personal topic for all of us, and that is the use of alcohol. So when does it become problematic? Now, Ari and Sally will share their experiences with alcohol and where they are at now. And then we're just going to unpack it. And with all my interviews, I don't prepare questions. It's just a natural conversation because I feel we can get so much more from just being open. So let's start with yourself, Ari. Say background about yourself. Let's start off with the yachting industry, how long you've been in the yachting industry for, and your journey with alcohol per se. Yeah. So I'm Ari. I'm 34 years old, or 33 rather, 34 soon, and I'm from Australia. And I've been in yachting for just over five years now. And it's been really rewarding, amazing industry. I'm really glad I, glad I transitioned into it when I did. So Got a lot to offer a lot of people. I, in, shall I talk about alcohol now? Sure, go for it. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the, as an Australian, yeah. it's quite sorry, Karina, do you want to say something? For the listeners, we have done an interview together. So, if you do go to Yachting International Radio and maybe search Ari or keyword, it might come up. And it's a very valuable interview to watch. I know Sally's watched it. So, maybe Sally can also give feedback when we go over to Sally about what she got out of that interview. So yeah, Ari, over to you, back to that question of your experience with alcohol and how it's and how it has brought you to where you are today. Okay. With alcohol, I think we can all agree, there's a lot of fun, but it has those issues as well. Culturally in Australia, it's quite common to start drinking young and I wasn't really an exception. I started drinking at 13, maybe even 12, I think actually I had a few drinks. And then by 13, I was drinking basically every weekend and drinking to the point of blackout most weekends. And it became so part of my nature, part of my culture, that it was really a part of my identity. It became, it became funny, I guess. So I, I was a guy that always do, would have these crazy stories to tell. And it, and it led me to some amazing scenarios. I went to some amazing places and met some amazing people, but I guess it was always, I caveat that with, there was always this sinister underside of it. That un- unfortunately, bad things would happen to me. I put myself in situations which were just, which were unfortunate. There was a time when I was viciously assaulted, grievously harmed, 12 surgeries, almost $40,000 worth to, to fix. And I look okay now, but that was three years, three years of that just because I was out drinking, doing stupid stuff one night. And the relationships have been challenged, unfortunately to say, but a lot of those people stuck by me. And supporting me through that. So I, I don't think I've really lost anyone, but it very easily could have happened. And I suppose for Ari, I knew it was an issue in my early twenties. I knew it was an issue because I was starting to get, in, get into dramas. By the time I was 22, I had that incident, which I mentioned, and I was trying to battle it already at that point. I didn't really have great success with it until my late twenties. And it took some very frank conversations with myself, realizing what it was, because it, it, there's not much talk about it. There is a, a bit more now, but. Like 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of people talking about it, that it was such an issue. And when people think of what an alcoholic is, they don't really identify with people that are just having fun or perhaps aren't hitting people or yelling at people or being violent or aggressive, which isn't my nature, but it was definitely having quite an influence on my life negatively. And I wasn't achieving the things I wanted to achieve because I was hungover. I was stressing those relationships as I was talking about. And finally... I'd say I've got a really good handle on it now. It took a long period of that, several attempts at it, really. And, but yeah, I have been working on it for probably 10 years and been successful at it for the most part for about three years or so with a few slip ups, but definitely and then great success within the last 12 months, I'd say. Yeah, incredible. Gosh, thank you so much for sharing that, Ari. I'm going to go to Sally, but then I want to go back to you and ask 
what strategies you put into place to get to where you are today. Sure. Thank you. Sally, maybe we can start off, yeah, your background in yachting, the relationship that you have with yachting, where you're at today, and your experience of watching Ari's previous interview. Okay. Hi, I'm Sally. I was in the yachting industry for eight years. I've been out of the industry now for two. I watched Ari's interview on Yachting International Radio and I realized that his story was so similar to mine. I started drinking at a very young age. We were drinking every weekend. And of course, when it, when I got into my twenties, it was a problem, but I never, I guess the difference is I never really acknowledged it. I just brushed it off as. Oh, whatever. I was having fun and I was just a bit drunk that night. As it's progressed into my late 20s, there have been some really catastrophic nights that have resulted not in physical harm, but in harm not just to myself, but my husband mostly in the respect that I lost my engagement ring when he first gave it to me, which he spent a lot of money on, which was so awful for both of us. I think, yeah, so it, that was maybe like the first point where I was really like, whoa, this is a problem. And he told me then, this is a problem. You can't continue like this. And I guess it's taken from then till... I actually watched the interview to really look at myself and go, yeah, there, there is a problem here. Because I just thought, I'm just drinking at the weekends and sometimes in the week. Oh, and a Monday. Oh, actually, that's every day. And yeah, it's just taken a while to acknowledge there's a problem. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where I am now. Okay, so what action specifically have you taken to abstain? So after I saw the interview, I decided that I would just stop drinking every day. I would start alternating the day. So I would drink one day and I'd drink the next day. And I put it down to the confinement. I wasn't doing anything. I didn't have anything that I needed to get up for, whatever. And then when we were talking in our goal setting into group chat, I, I realized actually I, it was always coming back around to drinking. And I was like, oh God, this is the problem. This, I need to face it now. And then I was like, okay, from Sunday. So I allowed myself to drink. On a Saturday night with some friends from a Sunday until my husband returns, which was, I think, about six weeks. It's now even longer because he's coming home on time. I would just stop drinking. And apart from one evening when I had a glass of wine, I've been, it's been okay. It's pretty okay. <laughs> it's not the best of times <laughs> on a Friday night. I'm like, so boring. <laughs> yeah, that's but. a massive sense of accomplishment because it's not easy. And I'm assuming, did you go through any experience of withdrawals or anything like that? A cravings, mm-hmm. urges? Definitely cravings, which I've managed to subside with non-alcoholic beer. So when I'm like yesterday and I finished my week, on a high, my friend was popping over early evening to catch up before our curfew came in. And I was like, oh my God, I'd love to have a glass of wine right now. And I have a bottle of wine and I have gin in my cupboard where I just didn't finish it before I started this. I'm like, oh. I'm like, no, it's okay. I've got a non alcoholic beer. So I had that. And after that, I was okay, fine. I feel better now. Like, I feel. Like, I don't need, it was just that initial, I needed something to celebrate with that wasn't tea or water. (laughs) So that really helped. But I haven't really, I don't think I've had any side effects, only 
good ones. You're not being hung over every day. Like I get up at seven or eight and I actually do yoga yeah. and I can do my French lessons and I'm not like, oh, why don't I understand this? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's why that's. And oh, another rule. Oh, great. Cool. I'll write that down. And then it's everything is just so much clearer, which is just so much better. And so, brilliant. and I know that I already said to you when you came to this realization that I'm going to abstain to not worry if you do have a drink or two, because you can always start again. It's not a big deal. And I think a lot of people give up on themselves because they're like, oh, I failed. What's the point to just as well continue drinking? And it's not about that. It's a lot of it. It's about learning about your triggers. And one of your triggers that you mentioned was being in a social environment or being around people you don't know and using it as a social lubricant. And on the first weekend, you decided, you know what, this is going to be a bit too much for me, so I'm going to stay at home. And then you build up the confidence when you feel okay with being in that environment, a drinking environment, to not drink. Yeah. Yeah. When I had this glass of wine, I was at a social event and basically I didn't know anyone. And my friend, she was like, come along. It'll be, and I was like, you know what? I can't stay indoors forever. Like I need to continue this and continue to learn how to be social without it. Oh, and I got there and I was like, oh, and everyone was speaking in French. No one was speaking in English. And I was like, after, where do you come from? What do you do? I was like, and I was like, you know what? I was like, I just, I'm going to have a glass of wine. And we'd been talking about it because before I left, I was sat at home and I was like, oh, just have one gin and tonic. No, no. And then I was like, if I have one in my mind, like I've had one, I'll have two. Then I'd have more drinks there. So I was like, no. So I put the bottle back. I went straight to my friends. I was like, I'm really sorry I'm early because I can't be at home with everything around me. And she was like, that's so good, well done. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, thanks. And then when we went there, I was like, and, I, and she was like, okay, one, you can have one. And I was like, okay, all right, thanks. So I knew that if I wasn't with her, I would have been like, no one really knows. I'll just continue to have a few more glasses. And then I would have been so much more drunk than normal because I haven't been drinking. And she was like, how do you feel now? And I was like, much better. And she was like, back to your non-alcoholic beer. And I was like, okay. And then it was fine. And so I had that little like buzz, but it felt really nice to not be gradually getting more and more drunk either, which is what I would normally do. And then I'd be like, whoa. Yes. Good French anyway. So... I'm so glad that she's had my back and yeah, I got through that evening that way. And I didn't feel guilty the next day. I was, that was good. I only had one. I didn't lose control. I didn't then just throw the towel in. And I think coming from what Ari said, about don't beat yourself up about it. And I'm, yeah, it was just one. Wow. Well, that's okay. Try not to do it again. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. So, yeah. Ari, do you have anything to add to that? I'd just say hats off to Sally. That's, that's an amazing accomplishment. I think there's all different ways to tackle it and strategies that are going to be different from person to person. But for me, I think if I'm remembering correctly, you, your final goal is not to be abstinent from alcohol. It's to be in control of your alcohol intake. So to me, it sounds like that was a massive win. You've gone there with a goal of not being drunk and you left not being drunk and you've managed to enjoy one glass responsibly. And ultimately that is your final goal. So you managed to accomplish that and you did it with a plum. So really well done. That's great. It wasn't all my doing. I must admit, if it was up to me, I would have finished the bottle. In a way it is your doing because you've, you've put the support network in place, haven't you? This is a friend that you reached out to. You've understood and you've identified that this person is going to be able to assist you in this. And you put yourself in the scenario in which they could assist you. You can't do everything on your own. So this person's understood the scenario, summed it up really well and said, look, she's going to 
she wants to have a glass of wine under my supervision. She's going to have a glass of wine and then I'm going to make sure that's all she has and she's enjoyed it. And now he's left with a really positive experience. So in, in all, this has been a positive experience in, on the whole in which she managed to enjoy the alcohol. So from this, you're going to learn so much and there, there probably will be setbacks in the future. And hopefully there won't be, but if there is, and when you, if you did have three or four glasses of wine, you know what? You'll remember back to that time that you did enjoy it responsibly and you're like, wow, you know what? That was, that's where I want to be at. But I'll get back to that point. And if I just want to relay perhaps from my own experience, I wasn't really going off anyone who had any insight to offer me in this. So the way I tackled it was absolute abstinence. And like you said, you weren't going to social engagements. You weren't interacting with people. And that was my strategy. And in, in hindsight, that wasn't optimal to just lock yourself away from everyone. Because I feel in some ways, while my mental health and physical health was getting better in some capacities, in other ways, it was perhaps slightly suffering and that I was not being as socially interactive as I'm used to being in the past. So I think a balance needs to be struck in that if you're having one glass of wine, but you're still having these social interactions, which obviously you crave, then on the whole, this is net positive as opposed to net negative, just because you've had one glass of wine. I'm not an authority in this, so I don't want to coach you in the correct way to do it. Like I could just speak from my own experiences as to how that works. But I think what you've done to me sounds like treading that line of balance really well. So I would say credit to you. That's an excellent accomplishment. Thanks a lot. So with regards to justifications, I'd love to know a little bit more about what each of you, what your justifications were. So for example, you might not be abusive or you're only, they call it the weekend warrior. You're only drinking on the weekends. Therefore, you don't have an issue. What are some of those justifications? I could start there if you like. So justifications for me is that I'm an extremely entertaining drunk. I'm witty. I'm smart. I tell great jokes. I'm funny. And then that sort of degrades over the night to maybe Larrick and antics and Maybe, oh, I just, I probably don't do it anymore, but maybe in my twenties, some light vandalism, tipping over a bin or whatever, which was hilarious at the time and things like that. And then the next day there'd be stories and people, the, how funny was that? That was hilarious. That was great. So that would overcome, overcome an assuasion, feelings of guilt and the physical feeling of being extremely hungover, perhaps not accomplishing anything the next couple of days. And that's, that was a justification for me is that it was funny. I was giving something of reward to my friends. And that they had a funny story, they were entertained. And I felt I was a bit like a court jester jumping around to everyone else's pleasure at my own expense. So that was a massive justification to me that it was just so entertaining and that perhaps I was the center of attention in a way. And I think perhaps it's really hard, I guess, looking back, I wouldn't have thought that I was socially anxious, but I suppose perhaps I was, and I was using the alcohol to overcome that social anxiety. It's such a long time ago now, but that seems to make a lot of sense. In hindsight, so the justification was, I just need to relax a bit and just so I can be part of the social scene, I suppose. It's amazing how the brain can condition us to associate things. So, for example, something like excessive drinking should be regarded or perceived as dangerous, unhealthy, and helpful. But your justification has forged a positive association with drinking. So when you work with people that are resistant to change, a effective tool is to do a cost-benefit analysis or pros and cons list to work out your, the positives and what are the negatives. And what you find is that there's so many more negatives rather than positives, but the positive is so strong that we can't even think about the side effects. So isn't it fascinating how the brain works to create these associations around things that are not so positive? Oh, absolutely, Corinne. I think you're spot on there. And I think even to this day, I still really enjoy alcohol. And I do intend to enjoy alcohol responsibly in the future. I think I've said as much. There's going to be occasions I'm getting married, hopefully sometime this year. COVID allowed. But I want to have a, I want to have a bucks night. I want my, my, my guy friends to be around. I want to go out. I want to drink too many beers. And I want to do that in a way that's but with a plan and there's, I'm justifying that, aren't they? Cause you know, I just, des- I deserve it, whatever. And it seems illogical. Why would you put yourself in a situation where I'll probably be hung over for two or three days afterwards, but why would you do that? It's really hard to actually justify to you or to anyone why you would do that for yourself. But you, like you say, the positive, the one positive of having that fun experience for 
a fleeting amount of time, a few hours, you can weigh that up as more valuable than the proceeding and the, and the pain after the post pain as well. Yeah, for sure. Sunny, how about you, your justifications? Yeah, yeah like relatively similar to Ari, where I definitely used it as a social advocate. Like, I, I think that's where I still miss it the most now. And once I've had a few drinks, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm more witty, like a little bit funny. I just come out with things that people either find shocking or, like, wow, that's so cool, and tell these stories of I was in yachting or whatever. And also, I think something that the justification of the more I drank, the less hungover I'd be, which is weird. But if I drank more consistent, consistently, I wouldn't then be hungover. I guess I'd just be consistently drunk for a while. And so for me, if I have a big night, for example, on Saturday, I would drink a lot on Friday. And then on Saturday, I would, I don't know, yeah, it's really tough. I guess there's so many, there's so many justifications that I have surrounding it and I can find one in every corner. I remember a really good one that you mentioned was I don't drink a bottle of vodka in the morning, therefore I'm not an alcoholic. This, yeah, I think when I first decided to do this, I was like, what's being an alcoholic? And I wasn't really sure. So I went online and I found the definition of an alcoholic and I looked at all the points and there was about 15 points and I was every single one of those apart from the one that was I don't open a bottle of vodka at in the morning I don't have it with my breakfast yeah it was the only one that I didn't do and then I was like mm, actually I would be quite partial to a mimosa with and I was like so technically that's True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that I think you have a vision in your mind of what an alcoholic looks like. And for me, I was always like, no, I don't need it every day. And then by five o'clock, I'm like, oh, I love a glass of wine. Open a bottle of wine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not doing anything tomorrow. Or I don't have to be up that early. Or I'll just have a couple. And then I know that a couple would turn into one more or, yeah, there's just so many different rules where I could justify it at any stage, I think. Yeah. But try to. So for both of you, you're in serious relationships and obviously you're surrounded by people that care and love you. What were the comments or what were they saying to you with regards to your relationship with alcohol do you remember yeah do you actually remember what they were saying yeah, culturally within my family we don't have a strong alcohol it's not culturally strong in our family to drink a lot so it was interesting that it just happened to be a nature of who I was growing up with that led to my drinking of alcohol so I had an extremely supportive father who he actually didn't drink at all now he has a few casual glasses of peanut here and there but he didn't drink at all with, when I was growing up, like zero. He was complete abstinent. And I think I suppose he just thought it was part of growing up, which it is in a lot of ways in Australia. So he, they didn't really see it as much of an issue. But I think definitely in my late teens and my early 20s, my dad, who was very understanding, was just like, maybe it's okay to not drink so much sometimes. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. All right, dad. He's like, is, is, you would feel better about yourself if you weren't so hungover. Just take it from me. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever, dad. I didn't really take it on board until, yeah, until things escalated to be quite bad in my mid twenties and, and yeah, my mid to late, early to mid twenties. Then he was really supportive and he was really good and he understood. I suppose he is not a, he's not a counselor. He didn't really know how to do it, but he was always really su supportive of me and understanding of what it was, even though he didn't really have much experience it with it himself. But for me, that was great having my father's support. Initially, your friends. They don't really understand it like when initially you try to tackle it, you try to reduce your intake because to them, they don't have to have your hangover. So they think it's hilarious. They think it's great. They love Drungari. So for them, they were like, what? No, come on. One of my very good friends, he'd have a, 
you know, the saying when you say, uh, come out just for a couple of quiet Jaeger bombs. A couple of quiet Jaeger bombs, all right? <laughs> if you're not familiar with the Jaeger bomb, it's obviously shots. So you, no one goes out for quiet shots. So <laughs> he knew that if he got a couple of Jaeger bombs into me, then it's a game over. But after a while, I did, I actually had a, I had a good chat with a friend, that same friend, in fact. And I told him how much I was struggling with it. And he was completely supportive. He was, he couldn't believe actually. He felt honored that I was reaching out to him. He's like, wow, thank you for reaching out to me. I'm going to help you with this. And he, and he helped me a lot to just be accountable and also not to feel guilty about being hungover when I was or not being able to keep control of my intake as well. And that was really important to have a peer look at you in the eyes without judgment. And then you yourself, you don't feel, because quite often as an alcohol, you feel like a piece of shit, basically. At the end of the day, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm a piece of shit. I can't control myself. I can't keep on top of things. What's wrong with me? And you see other people out there in the world and you think, what is wrong with me? Because you don't see everyone else's problems and hardships they're having. And everyone's struggling with something. And a lot more people than I think we're willing to admit struggle with alcohol. So to have a friend be able to just look you in the eye, face you, not have that judgment was meant a lot to me. I think that was a big, that was a big issue, a big reason why I was eventually able to conquer it. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Sally. Do you have any? Uh, yeah. I mean, at the beginning of the relation, my relationship with Alex, we, to get away from the boat, we often would go to a bar in the evening. And so our relationship basically started drinking a lot together. And Alex can drink a whole lot more than I can and be okay. And it wasn't until maybe a couple of years into our relationship where he's, you have to stop matching what I'm drinking because I would match exactly what he was drinking. But obviously I'd be like totally drunk, not be able to talk, but like waddle along like next to him. I'm okay. I'm okay. And just try and to keep up with that was just impossible. And I think that's where he first made it apparent that I needed to slow down and not not drink the same as him and things. So that was definitely like the first point with, or maybe not the first point in relationships. It's always affected relationships throughout my life. And then, yeah, I think my going into family a little bit, like my granddad died of alcohol alcohol abuse so in my mind I've always looked at that and thought need to be careful just in case it's hereditary which I remember that's true or not but I need to keep that in the back of my mind since I decided to give alcohol I explained to my mum and she was like I drink much and I was like no I do I do like I drink a lot. And she was like, oh, yeah, I try and have one night off a week. Oh, I don't even know why I do that, really. And I was a bit like, okay. And the last time I spoke to her, and I guess it's it's been on my mind since I spoke to her, but she didn't even ask me. She didn't even ask how it was going. I dropped it in a few times. Of, oh, I've been down to the beach for a few sundowners, non-alcoholic, obviously. And she didn't ask about it at all. And I was really like, like, I, I guess uh, looking at it, thinking that maybe her problem is bigger than, like, than we think or she knows because she's not even acknowledging because she knows we drink very similar ways. And when we sit on a Skype phone call, we'd often drink a bottle of wine together. And it was one of the, one of the things that I was like, wow, I really have to stop because like, we didn't remember finishing the phone call. And that's like sitting up home alone, talking to my mum. So it was a really big thing for me. And yeah, that, yeah, it's been a little bit to process. That you're mentioning. And I think if you look at the cycle of change, there needs to be self-awareness that there is a problem and there needs to be a willingness to change. If right. those two aren't there, you're sitting in denial. Yeah. And you're not ready for change. And that's why there's that saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yeah. And I think that's 
the hardest for for both. So say if that was the case for your mum, like for you to see life on the other side and to recognise there is a problem and you do have the willingness and motivation to change and maybe you're looking at the dynamic from a different lens and you're both holding up mirrors and the one doesn't want to look at themselves in the mirror, whereas perhaps for you, you're willing to look at yourself in the mirror and because you care about your mum so much to see where she's at, you might see a bit of you in her and that could also trigger you and make you feel sad. Yeah, definitely. Ari? I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. I don't really have anything to add there because I think Sally really, really nailed it. I was nodding here in agreement as she was fleshing out the thoughts. And to me, it sounds quite obvious. Again, I really hate to too much because I'm just not an expert in these things. But just judging from the way that you presented the story, Sally, that I think you really nailed it there. I think your mother also is probably in a, in a state of denial. And by her, her listening to you, if she needed to offer support or guidance, she would have to confront her own reality, which she does, she's not ready to do at the moment. So that's probably why she can't quite offer you the support that would be really helpful to you right now. Yeah. It's very powerful, that feeling of, of having to look at yourself through the looking glass and just be upfront with yourself. It's painful. It's painful to do. And she's not quite ready yet. Uh, hopefully mm-hmm. she'll get there. Yeah. So from both of your perspectives, in terms of friends, family who want to support someone who is having struggles with managing the use of alcohol, what do you think they could do to be supportive? What does that look like? Think about where you were at. What do you... Uh, yeah, uh, it, really, you've got to... It's not until that thing you were mentioning, Corinne, where you were saying the self-awareness. Like, it's really hard to make someone else self-aware. So someone has to come to the conclusion themselves and show that spark. So, for example... No one's going to, me during my journey, if I go up to someone else to tell them that they've got an alcohol problem, whether it's true or not, it's really hard, hard to hear that from someone else. Yeah. I don't know the strategies you have to bring that awareness to someone else, whether that it even exists. I just don't know. But once, once they're at that point, you have to, you just have to be understanding and not judgmental. I think that for me was the best, like having people who are non judgmental and just willing to listen was huge because all of a sudden that feeling of guilt and that feeling of shame wasn't there anymore. I'm like, oh, great. Why did I talk about this earlier? Because to have people that don't treat you in that way just allows you to stop worrying about that and then start worrying about the problem. I'd say that's the best you can do to be supportive. Just be supportive as possible. And that was the big thing coming out to me, being non-judgmental, because that's huge because you were referring to before about belief systems not, not feeling good enough perhaps and thinking you're the only one be struggling right now. And when we sit with guilt and shame and we feel judged, we're more likely to drink more, to mask it. And then it just becomes a vicious cycle. I agree with that 100%. Yeah. It's hard though when you can see someone hurting themselves and you've got to sit in that and not make side comments. And as I said before, getting on this call, like it's very, it's a different experience for me working with clients versus friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think having some distance from it can definitely help from a counseling perspective. I would say if you were distance from something, it would be much more easy to approach it and look at things, I suppose, a little analytically because you're not thinking perhaps how it affects you directly. Uh, I think, for instance, if someone in my life was struggling a lot with it these days, because I have my own personal journey, it's much easier because then I can just tell them my story and then instantly they're like, oh, okay, you've gone through it. And I'm, I make a point of not being judgmental and say, and being quoted to the fact that I failed many times in my journey, but eventually I did succeed. And it took me a lot longer than it would probably take a lot of other people if they knew what I knew now and that if you reach out, if you talk to people. But at the time, I actually openly expressed by my thoughts verbally about the pain I was feeling years and years ago, years of wasted time, basically, in which I could have been making my thoughts feel better as a person and tackling this and perhaps even just having a more positive relationship with alcohol in general. And that what took me 10 years or 12 years or maybe even 15 years to accomplish with hopefully with the way that we're, we're more open and talking about these things these days, 
it takes someone a much, much shorter amount of time. And I'm really hopeful and I'm really optimistic that Sally's journey is going to be a, a whole lot faster than mine and a whole lot easier. And I think we've got modern times to thank for that and people being more open to talking about these kind of things, which is fantastic. But I think having the conversation is already a win. So having the conversation with people is massive. So I think that's what, you, what we can do. And if you can think about ways to have the, the conversation with some, perhaps some people you think are suffering with it in a non-judgmental way, it's easier said than done, I know. But if you can figure out a way to do that, then perhaps you can get them to see that maybe they want to make better life choices for themselves. Yeah, for sure. So with all of us, our background in yachting, we are quite aware of what the culture is. You know, it's a massive drinking culture. I know back 10 years ago, we were always talking about going for rosé lunches and it would just go on for hours. And I've never been a massive drinker. I think I had way too many drinks in my 30th and I've never been able to drink too much expense. I've got a cap of two drinks and then I'm done. But I remember as a yachty, I got to a point where I was just like trying to chuck my shooters in the bush without them seeing. And yeah, how do you, because you get so sucked into it, that lifestyle. And as a yachty, how do you deal with that and differentiate between what's normal and what's not normal? Yachting is special in that it's a bubble outside of reality and that we there's expectations in the yachting industry to be super professional but you've also got to be super fun you've got to be a, a really you live with the people you work with so you can't it's i had this issue exactly on the boat when i was going through my through long periods of absence i'd be on the boat and i was finding as a bosun working on board it was a little bit hard sometimes to connect with the lads and it's really important as a bosun you got five guys that you're looking after You've got to build relationships with these guys. It's incredibly important. And you've got to do it in a way. I benefited, just, just verbalizing my thoughts here, is that I, I benefited from being a little bit older. I joined yachting when I was 28. Not to say that's old necessarily, but it's older than the norm. So I naturally was older than the guys that I was working with. So I could take a more of an uncle style figure, take more of a mentor's figure. And there, I guess there wasn't as big an expectation from them on me to drink as much. And I could also say to the guys with a bit of authority and say, guys, I'm really happy for you to go out and have fun, but you've also got to keep, you have to be sober for work. That's end of the story. So I managed to create that identity for myself and that I was the letter of the law and that I kept things under good job. It doesn't help when you've got chief officers and maybe even captains in some people's situation drinking just as much. You still will get support from people. I got support from other people that perhaps drank too much that I was trying to keep that culture under wraps. But you, again, you have to be pragmatic. You have to understand that it is part of the culture. So it's about redu harm reduction, not complete abstinence because guys are going to party, guys are going to drink and you have to allow them to because some guys' motivation and some girls' motivation, sorry, is to come into the industry is to have fun. They're there to travel the world, make a bit of cash and have the time of their lives. And it's not up to me to take that away from them, yeah. but I can provide the structure of what's appropriate and what's more importantly, safe. Uh, and that's what I always tried to do. And I had an incredible, I guess, success with that. I found that there was no gray area with that for me because I guess through my own journey, my own battles, I always on the yacht from position of authority led by example. I was always the guy that was home by midnight. I was always the guy that showed up to work sober. So. For me, uh, there was no gray area. There's a story with this chief officer that I, that I won't mention names. I think I've chatted about it perhaps with you in the past. I've definitely talked about it publicly. A guy that I detest that would have the worst morals where he would tell someone that was hungover just on the chance that he wasn't hungover. He would throw someone under the bus, put them on a weekend watch, or this and that. But then he'd show up to work an hour late sometimes. He's like, where's the consistency there? So that that's, sorry, when the fuck? I actually forgot the answer to the question, but that's my experience with it in that, I guess, it, the, okay, the, the question was, how do we deal with it? it yeah, that's the culture in yachting. We have to be open to the fact that it is going to be apparent and we just have to find that balance in between what's fun and what's safe, to yeah. sum it all up. Yes, 100%. And that's why processes and procedures are designed to keep us safe. And it's about... Being accountable to 
Yeah. Definitely. Accountability is 100%. Yeah. So for those who have watched the interview and this interview and they might be thinking, oh, hold on a minute. Do I drink too much? I end up coming back on board at 2 a.m. and it's quite a frequent thing. And I know of some crew who have been let go because they were drinking on the job and filling up their water bottles with a spirit so that they couldn't detect it. So that is a very clear sign that there's something wrong. But if you wanted to learn more about whether you do have an issue with alcohol, what would your suggestion be? To learn and more. I think for me, I couldn't give you one resource. I think there's a great one that used to pop up. I guess the algorithms realized on my Facebook and my Google and everything that I've been looking for these things. But you hear about this one year, no beer challenge, which is a really great, have you heard of this? One year, no beer. Wow. It's a, it's an accountability program, basically. It's how people that get together on a forum. I never partook and I just thought it was a great idea. And it'd always pop up in my advertisements. You pay a nominal fee. So you can be part of this community in which you attempt to go uh, a certain amount of time without for abstaining from alcohol. And it starts at a month and then you can do three months and then the ultimate challenge is one year, no beer. And that's great. It's great because if you look at that one, one beer, there's a lot of people that give their experiences with alcohol, which is confronting because like we've been talking about, there's a lot of justification and you think, no, I'm not an alcoholic because of the 15 things that like Sally was talking about, there's actually two that I'm not. So how can I be that person when I'm only 13 out of 15? When realistically... I think if you're 15 out of 15, you're probably well on the way. That's a great resource to just see other people's things and think, okay, it might, I might be what's called a functioning alcoholic or even a highly functioning alcoholic and that I rely on it. It has a detrimental effect on my health and well-being, but I still get by in life. And maybe if I'm achieving a lot compared to a lot of other people. But if I think if you wake up the next day with a feeling of shame, with a feeling of, I wish I didn't do that, Mm-hmm. That to me is the ultimate sign of you're an alcoholic. Okay. If you wake up and you're like, oh, I've been hungover, so you go out and you have a great time that day. And there are people that live that way. And that to me, they're not alcoholics because they don't live with that feeling of shame. And that is the line for me. I think there are people out there that could quite ha- happily have, as long as it's not impacting their health too negatively, they could have drinks most nights of the week and function and not feel, have a, any bad feeling. I, I don't know. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm sure there's some very severe health implications otherwise, but from the emotional and mental well-being, I think that's where the alcoholic should be defined. And I think more people are like that than we care to admit. Wonderful advice. Thanks, Ari. And I just wanted to add to that. I think it's important as a way to build self-awareness to just take note of your patterns and behaviors because then you can look back and go, oh gosh, I have had been out five times this week and have drunk a lot. And so that, yeah, it, to see that on paper, I think is so effective to be able to gain more insight into your behaviors. So you just, yeah, track, sure. just track it. Yeah. Excellent. Sally. I would say that, yeah, I, one of the things that started creeping up for me. Uh, was hearing other people speaking about alcohol. Going back to the interview was sort of start. And then I was discussing the other day with friends, like they were saying, oh, yeah, it's really nice to have a couple of beers at sundown. And then they're like, yeah, no, I could happily not drink anymore after that. And I was like, whoa, like after I've had two beers, that's it for me. Like I want to drink more. And I was like, yeah, I'm totally not that person. So it was all these like little accounts that I've now been listening to that sort of swayed, or not swayed my mind, helped me realize that actually I'm not that sort of normal person with a normal relationship with alcohol. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And I just wanted to say a big thank you for showing up both of you and talking about such a personal topic. I have no doubt that there are going to be so many takeaways out of this conversation. And I just wanted to check in with you both. 
are you okay if the audience reaches out? They might have some questions. They're more than welcome to ask me. I'm always here. But it's also nice to connect with people. I know in prison they used to say, did you suffer from a heroin addiction? How do you know what it's like? <laughs> and I think, yeah, <laughs> with regards to that comment, we say if you want to reach out for help, and say you have, you need back surgery. Do you go to a GP or do you go to a specialist to deal with your back? That's how we gave insight to the prisoners. But I know that it is helpful talking to someone that has gone through the experience themselves. So are you open to people reaching out? I definitely am. I talk a lot with the yachting community on many different topics and aspects. And if that's something that people want to talk about with someone, then I'm happy to share my experience, listen to their experience. Thanks, Ari. Yeah, the same here. I don't feel I have a huge amount to offer on the flip side just yet. But yeah, I'm more than happy to connect with people if anyone is at the early stages or thinking of doing it. Yeah, I'm totally happy to listen and offer guidance wherever I can. Thanks, you both. And what is the best means to contact you? And the Instagram. Yep. And yeah, Instagram for me. I mean, I've got a few different accounts on Instagram. So you could type my name in Ari, A-R-I, Steel, S-T-E-E-L-E. And I've got one that I'm actually trying to push into a more yacht-centric one, which is Super Yacht Journey. Just one word, Super Yacht Journey. And you can be more than happy to welcome to add me on that. And we can talk about it. anything yachting, really. Wonderful. Thanks, Ari. And Sally, your handle? It's Sally underscore Kit. K-I-P underscore cooks. Perfect. Thank you both and especially joining me on a gorgeous Saturday and taking your time out of your weekend to do this. Really appreciate it. And I will hopefully see you guys in TCC Tribe on Thursday. (laughs)